The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 6, Side 2. In the age of Pisistratus, the mysteries of Dionysus entered into the Eleusinian liturgy by a religious infection. The god Iacus was identified with Dionysus as the son of Persephone, and the legend of Dionysus Zagreus was superimposed upon the myth of Demeter. But through all forms, the basic idea of the mysteries remained the same. As the seed is born again, so may the dead have renewed life, and not merely the dreary, shadowy existence of Hades, but a life of happiness and peace. When almost everything else in Greek religion had passed away, this consoling hope, reunited in Alexandria with that Egyptian belief in immortality from which the Greek had been derived, gave to Christianity the weapon with which to conquer the Western world. In the seventh century there came into Hellas from Egypt, Thrace, and Thessaly another mystic cult, even more important in Greek history than the mysteries of Eleusis. At its source we find, in the age of the Argonauts, the obscure but fascinating figure of Orpheus, a Thracian who, in culture, music, and poetry, says Diodorus, far surpassed all men of whom we have a record. Very probably he existed, though all that we now know of him bears the marks of myth. He is pictured as a gentle spirit, tender, meditative, affectionate, sometimes a musician, sometimes a reforming ascetic priest of Dionysus. He played the lyre so well and sang to it so melodiously that those who heard him almost began to worship him as a god. Wild animals became tame at his voice, and trees and rocks left their places to follow the sound of his harp. He married the fair Eurydice and almost went mad when death took her. He plunged into Hades charmed Persephone with his lyre and was allowed to lead Eurydice up to life again, on the condition that he should not look back upon her until the surface of the earth was reached. At the last barrier anxiety overcame him lest she should no longer be following. He looked back only to see her snatched down once more into the netherworld. Thracian women, resenting his unwillingness to console himself with them, tore him to pieces in one of their Dionysian revels. Zeus atoned for them by placing the lyre of Orpheus as a constellation among the stars. The severed head, still singing, was buried at Lesbos in a cleft that became the site of a popular oracle. There, we are told, the nightingales sang with a special tenderness. In later days it was claimed that he had left behind him many sacred songs, and perhaps it was so. At the behest of Hipparchus, says Greek tradition, a scholar named Onomacritus, about 520, edited these as the Homeric lays had been edited a generation before. In the sixth century or earlier, these hymns had acquired a sacred character as divinely inspired, and formed the basis of a mystical cult related to that of Dionysus, but far superior to it in doctrine, ritual, and moral influence. The creed was essentially an affirmation of the passion, or suffering, death and resurrection of the divine son Dionysus Zagreus, and the resurrection of all men into a future of reward and punishment. Since the Titans, who had slain Dionysus, were believed to have been the ancestors of man, a taint of original sin rested upon all humanity, and in punishment for this the soul was enclosed in the body as in a prison or a tomb. But man might console himself by knowing that the Titans had eaten Dionysus, and that therefore every man harbored in his soul a particle of indestructible divinity. In a mystical sacrament of communion, the Orphic worshippers ate the raw flesh of a bull as a symbol of Dionysus to commemorate the slaying and eating of the god, and to absorb the divine essence anew. After death, said Orphic theology, the soul goes down to Hades and must face judgment by the gods of the underworld. The Orphic hymns and ritual, like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, instructed the faithful in the art of preparing for this comprehensive and final examination. If the verdict was guilty, there would be severe punishment. One form of the doctrine conceived this punishment as eternal, and transmitted to later theology the notion of hell. Another form adopted the idea of transmigration. The soul was reborn again and again into lives happier or bitterer than before, according to the purity or impurity of its former existence. And this wheel of rebirth would turn until complete purity was achieved, and the soul was admitted to the islands of the blessed. Another variant offered hope that the punishment in Hades might be ended through penances performed in advance by the individual, or after his death by his friends. In this way a doctrine of purgatory and indulgences arose, and Plato describes with almost the anger of a Luther the peddling of such indulgences in the Athens of the 4th century BC. 
Mendicant prophets go to rich men's stores and persuade them that they have a power committed to them of making atonement for their sins or those of their fathers by sacrifices or charms. And they produce a host of books written by Musaeus and Orpheus, according to which they perform their ritual and persuade not only individuals but whole cities that expiations and atonements may be made by sacrifices and amusements, does he mean ceremonies, which fill a vacant hour and are equally at the service of the living and the dead. The latter, the ceremonies, they call mysteries, and these redeem us from the pains of hell. But if we neglect them, no one knows what awaits us. Nevertheless, there were in Orphism idealistic trends that culminated in the morals and monasticism of Christianity. The reckless looseness of the Olympians was replaced by a strict code of conduct, and the mighty Zeus was slowly dethroned by the gentle figure of Orpheus, even as Yahweh was to be dethroned by Christ. A conception of sin and conscience, a dualistic view of the body as evil and of the soul as divine, entered into Greek thought. The subjugation of the flesh became a main purpose of religion, as a condition for the release of the soul. The Brotherhood of Orphic Initiates had no ecclesiastical organization and no separate life, but they were distinguished by the wearing of white garments, the avoidance of flesh food, and a degree of asceticism not usually associated with Hellenic ways. They represented, in several respects, a Puritan reformation in the history of Greece. Their rites encroached more and more upon the public worship of the Olympian gods. The influence of the sect was extensive and enduring. Perhaps it was here that the Pythagoreans took their diet, their dress, and their theory of transmigration. It is worthy of note that the oldest Orphic documents now extant were found in southern Italy. Plato, though he rejected much in Orphism, accepted its opposition of body and soul, its Puritan tendency, its hope of immortality. Part of the pantheism and asceticism of Stoicism may be traced to an Orphic origin. The Neoplatonists of Alexandria possessed a large collection of Orphic writings, and based upon them much of their theology and their mysticism. The doctrines of hell, purgatory, and heaven, of the body versus the soul, of the divine son slain and reborn, as well as the sacramental eating of the body and blood and divinity of the God, directly or deviously influenced Christianity, which was itself a mystery religion of atonement and hope, of mystic union and release. The basic ideas and ritual of the Orphic cult are alive and flourishing amongst us today. 4. Worship Greek ritual was as varied as the kinds of deities that it honored. The Thonian gods received a gloomy ritual of appeasement and riddance, the Olympians a joyful ritual of welcome and praise. Neither form of ceremony required a clergyman. The father acted as priest for the family, the chief magistrate for the state. Life in Greece was not as secular as it has been described. Religion played a major part in it everywhere, and each government protected the official cult as vital to social order and political stability. But whereas in Egypt and the Near East the priesthood dominated the state, in Greece the state dominated the priesthood, took the leadership of religion, and reduced the clergy to minor functionaries in the temples. The property of the temples, in real estate, money, and slaves, was audited and administered by officials of the state. There were no seminaries for the training of priests. Anyone could be quietly chosen or appointed priest if he knew the rites of the god, and in many places the office was let out to the highest bidder. There was no hierarchy of priestly caste. The priests of one temple or state had usually no association with those of another. There was no church, no orthodoxy, no rigid creed. Religion consisted not in professing certain beliefs, but in joining in the official ritual. Any man might have his own creed, provided that he did not openly deny or blaspheme the city's gods. In Greece, church and state were one. The place of worship could be the domestic hearth, the municipal hearth in the city hall, some cleft in the earth for a Thonian deity, some temple for an Olympian god. The precincts of the temple were sacred and inviolable. Here the worshippers met, and here all pursued persons, even if tainted with serious crime, could find sanctuary. The temple was not for the congregation, but for the god. There, in his home, his statue was erected, and a light burned before it which was not allowed to die. Often the people identified the god with the statue. They washed, dressed, and tended the image carefully, and sometimes scolded it for negligence. They told how at various times the statue had sweated, or wept, or closed its eyes. In the temple records, a history was kept of the festivals of the god and of the major events in the life of the city or group that worshipped him. This was the source and first form of Greek historiography. 
The ceremony consisted of procession, chants, sacrifice, prayer, and sometimes a sacred meal. Magic and masquerade, tableaus, and dramatic representations might be part of the procession. In most cases, the basic ritual was prescribed by custom, and every movement of it, every word of the hymns and prayers, was preserved in a book kept sacred by the family or the state. Rarely was any syllable or action altered, or any rhythm. The god might not like or comprehend the novelty. The living speech changed, the ritual speech remained as before. In time, the worshippers ceased to understand the words they used, but the thrill of antiquity supplied the place of understanding. Often the ceremony outlasted even the memory of the cause that had prompted it. Then new myths were invented to explain its establishment. The myth or creed might change, but not the ritual. Music was essential to the whole process, for without music religion would be difficult. Music generates religion as much as religion generates music. Out of the temple and processional chants came poetry, and the meters that later adorned the robust profanity of Archilochus, the reckless passion of Sappho, and the scandalous delicacies of Anacreon. Having reached the altar, usually in front of the temple, the worshippers sought with sacrifice and prayer to avert the wrath or win the aid of their god. As individuals, they might offer almost anything of value, statues, reliefs, furniture, weapons, cauldrons, tripods, garments, pottery. When the gods could make no use of such articles, the priests could. Armies might offer part of their spoils, as Xenophon's ten thousand did in their retreat. Groups would offer the fruits of the field, the vines or the trees, more often an animal appetizing to the god, sometimes on occasions of great need a human being. Agamemnon offered Iphigenia for a wind. Achilles slaughtered twelve Trojan youths on the pyre of Patroclus. Human victims were hurled from the cliffs of Cyprus and Lucas to satiate Apollo. Others were presented to Dionysus in Chios and Tenedos. Themistocles is said to have sacrificed Persian captives to Dionysus at the Battle of Salamis. The Spartans celebrated the festival of Artemis Orthia by flogging youths, sometimes to death, at her altar. In Arcadia, Zeus received human sacrifice till the second century A.D. At Massalia, in time of pestilence, one of the poorer citizens was fed at public expense, clad in holy garments, decorated with sacred boughs, and cast over a cliff to death with prayers that he might bear punishment for all the sins of his people. In Athens, it was the custom, in famine, plague, or other crisis, to offer to the gods, in ritual mimicry or in actual fact, one or more scapegoats for the purification of the city. And a similar rite, mimic or literal, was annually performed at the festival of the Thargelia. These victims in Athens were called pharmakoi, which meant originally magicians. Pharmakon meant a magic spell or formula, then a healing drug. The question whether the pharmakoi were really slain is in dispute, but there is little doubt that the sacrifice was originally literal. In the course of time, human sacrifice was mitigated by restricting its victims to condemned criminals and dulling their senses with wine. Finally, it was replaced by the sacrifice of an animal. When, on the night before the Battle of Leuctra, in 371 B.C., the Boeotian leader Pelopidas had a dream that seemed to demand a human sacrifice at the altar as the price of victory, some of his counselors advised it, but others protested against it, saying that such a barbarous and impious obligation could not be pleasing to any supreme beings, the Typhons and giants did not preside over the world, but the general father of gods and mortals, that it was absurd to imagine any divinities and powers delighting in slaughter and sacrifice of men. Animal sacrifice, then, was a major step in the development of civilization. The beasts who bore the brunt of this advance in Greece were the bull, the sheep, and the pig. Before any battle, the rival armies sent up sacrifices in proportion to their desired victory. Before any assembly in Athens, the meeting place was purified by the sacrifice of a pig. The piety of the people, however, broke down at the crucial point. Only the bones and a little flesh, wrapped in fat, went to the god. The rest was kept for the priests and the worshippers. To excuse themselves, the Greeks told how, in the days of the giants, Prometheus had wrapped the edible portions of the sacrificial animal in skin and the bones in fat, and had asked Zeus to choose which he preferred. Zeus had with both hands chosen the fat. It was true that Zeus was enraged upon finding that he had been deceived, but he had made his choice and must abide by it forever. Only in sacrifice to the Thonian gods was everything surrendered to the deity, and the entire animal burnt to ashes in a holocaust. The divinities of the lower world were more feared than those of Olympus. No common meal followed a phonic sacrifice, for that might tempt the god to come and join the feast. 
but after sacrifice to the Olympians, the worshippers, not in awed atonement to the god but in joyous communion with him, consumed the consecrated victim. The magic formulas pronounced over it had, they hoped, imbued it with the life and power of the god, which would now pass mystically into his communicants. In like manner wine was poured upon the sacrifice and then into the cups of the worshippers, who drank, so to speak, with the gods. In the theosoi, or fraternities, into which so many trade and social groups in Athens were organized, this idea of divine communion in a common religious meal formed the binding tie. Animal sacrifice continued throughout Greece until ended by Christianity, which wisely substituted for it the spiritual and symbolical sacrifice of the Mass. In some measure, prayer too became a substitute for sacrifice. It was a clever amendment that commuted offerings of blood into litanies of praise. In this gentler way, man, subject to chance and tragedy at every step, consoled and strengthened himself by calling to his aid the mysterious powers of the world. 5. Superstitions Between these upper and nether poles of Greek religion, the Olympian and the subterranean, surged an ocean of magic, superstition, and sorcery. Behind and below the geniuses whom we shall celebrate were masses of people poor and simple, to whom religion was a mesh of fears rather than a ladder of hope. It was not merely that the average Greek accepted miracle stories of Theseus rising from the dead to fight at Marathon or of Dionysus changing water into wine. Such stories appear among every people and are part of the forgivable poetry with which imagination brightens the common life. One could even pass over the anxiety of Athens to secure the bones of Theseus and of Sparta to bring back from Tegea the bones of Orestes. The miraculous power officially attributed to these relics may well have been part of the technique of rule. What oppressed the pious Greek was the cloud of spirits that surrounded him, ready and able, he believed, to spy upon him, interfere with him, and do him evil. These demons were always seeking to enter into him. He had to be on his guard against them at all times, and to perform magical ceremonies to disperse them. This superstition verged on science and in some measure forecast our germ theory of disease. All sickness to the Greek meant possession by an alien spirit. To touch a sick person was to contract his uncleanliness or possession. Our bacilli and bacteria are the currently fashionable forms of what the Greeks called caries, or little demons. So a dead person was unclean. The caries had gotten him once for all. When the Greek left a house where a corpse lay, he sprinkled himself with water from a vessel placed for such purposes at the door to drive away from himself the spirit that had conquered the dead man. This conception was extended to many realms where even our bacteriophobia would hardly apply it. Sexual intercourse rendered a person unclean. So did birth, childbirth, and homicide, even if unintentional. Madness was possession by an alien spirit. The madman was beside himself. In all these cases, a ceremony of purification was considered necessary. Periodically, homes, temples, camps, even whole cities were purified, and very much as we disinfect them, by water, smoke, or fire. A bowl of clean water stood at the entrance to every temple, so that those who came to worship might cleanse themselves, perhaps by a suggestive symbolism. The priest was an expert in purification. He could exorcise spirits by striking bronze vessels, by incantations, magic, and prayer, even the intentional homicide might by adequate ritual be purified. Repentance was not indispensable in such cases. All that was needed was to get rid of the evil possessive demons. Religion was not so much a matter of morals as a technique of manipulating spirits. Nevertheless, the multiplication of taboos and purificatory rites produced in the religious Greek a state of mind surprisingly akin to the Puritan sense of sin. The notion that the Greeks were immune to the ideas of conscience and sin will hardly survive a reading of Pindar, and Aeschylus. Out of this belief in an enveloping atmosphere of spirits came a thousand superstitions, which Theophrastus, successor to Aristotle, summarized in one of his characters. Superstitiousness would seem to be a sort of cowardice with respect to the divine. Your superstitious man will not sally forth for the day till he have washed his hands and sprinkled himself at the nine springs and put a bit of bay leaf from a temple in his mouth. And if a cat cross his path, he will not proceed on his way till someone else be gone by, or he have cast three stones across the street. Should he espy a snake in his house, if it be one of the red sort, he will call upon Dionysus. If it be a sacred snake, he will build a shrine, then and there. When he passes one of the smooth stones set up at crossroads, he anoints it with oil from his flask, and will not go his ways till he have knelt down and worshipped it. If a mouse gnaw a bag of his meal, 
He will off to the wizard and ask what he must do. And if the advice be send the bag to the cobblers to be patched, he neglects the advice and frees himself of the ill by rights of aversion. If he catches sight of a madman or an epileptic, he shudders and spits into his bosom. The simpler Greeks believed, or taught their children to believe, in a great variety of bogies. Whole cities were disturbed at short intervals by portents or strange occurrences like deformed births of animals or men. The belief in unlucky days was so widespread that on such days no marriage might take place, no assembly might be held, no courts might meet, no enterprise might begin. A sneeze, a stumble, might be reason for abandoning a trip or an undertaking. A minor eclipse could stop or turn back armies and bring great wars to a disastrous end. Again, there were persons gifted with the power of effective cursing. An angered parent, a neglected beggar might lay upon one a curse that would ruin one's life. Some persons possessed magic arts. They could mix love filters or aphrodisiacs, and could by secret drugs reduce a man to impotence or a woman to sterility. Plato did not consider his laws complete without an enactment against those who injure or slay by magic arts. Witches are not medieval inventions. Note Euripides's Medea and Theocritus's Synetha. Superstition is one of the most stable of social phenomena. It remains almost unchanged through centuries and civilizations, not only in its bases, but even in its formulas. 6. Oracles In a world so crowded with supernatural powers, the events of life seem to depend upon the will of demons and gods. To discover that will, the curious Greeks consulted soothsayers and oracles, who divined the future by reading the stars, interpreting dreams, examining the entrails of animals, or observing the flight of birds. Professional soothsayers hired themselves out to families, armies, and states. Nicias, before setting out upon the expedition to Sicily, engaged a troop of sacrificers, augurs, diviners. And though not all generals were as pious as this great slave owner, nearly all were as superstitious. Men and women appeared who claimed inspiration and clairvoyance. In Ionia, particularly, certain women called Sibyls, that is, the will of God, issued oracles believed by millions of Greeks. From Erythri, the Sibyl Herophila was said to have wandered through Greece to Cumae in Italy, where she became the most famous of her kind, and lived, we are told, a thousand years. Athens, like Rome, had a collection of ancient oracles, and the government maintained in the Prytaneum men skilled in their interpretation. Public oracles were set up at many temples in all parts of Greece, but the most famous and honored were in early days the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona, and in the historical period that of Apollo at Delphi. Barbarians, as well as Greeks, consulted this oracle. Even Rome sent messengers to ask or suggest the will of the god. Since the power of divination was supposed to belong particularly to the intuitive sex, three priestesses, each at least half a century old, were trained to consult Apollo through the medium of a trance. From a hollow in the earth below the temple came a peculiar gas, ascribed to the eternal decomposition of the python that Apollo had slain there. The officiating priestess, called Pythia, took her seat on a high tripod over this cleft, inhaled the divine stench, chewed narcotic laurel leaves, fell into delirium and convulsions, and thus inspired, uttered incoherent words which the priests translated to the people. Very often the final reply admitted of diverse, even contrary interpretations, so that the infallibility of the oracle was maintained, whatever the event. Possibly the priests were no less puppets than the priestesses. Sometimes they accepted bribes, and in most cases the voice of the oracle harmonized melodiously with the dominant influence in Greece. Nevertheless, where external powers did not constrain them, the priests taught valuable lessons of moderation and political wisdom to the Greeks. Though they condoned human sacrifice, even after the moral sense of Greece had begun to revolt against it, and made no protest against the immoralities of Olympus, they aided the establishment of law, encouraged the manumission of slaves, and bought many slaves in order to give them liberty. They were not in advance of Greek thought, but they did not hinder it by doctrinal intolerance. They gave a helpful supernatural sanction to necessary Greek policies, and provided some degree of international conscience and moral unity for the scattered cities of Greece. Out of this unifying influence came the oldest known confederation of Greek states, the Amphictyonic League was originally the religious alliance of the peoples dwelling around the sanctuary of Demeter near Thermopylae. The chief constituent states were Thessaly, Magnesia, Thyotis, Doris, Phocis, 
Boeotia, Euboea, and Achaea. They met semi-annually in spring at Delphi, in autumn at Thermopylae. They bound themselves never to destroy one another's cities, never to allow the water supply of any member city to be shut off, never to plunder, or permit to be plundered, the treasury of Apollo at Delphi, and to attack any nation that violated these pledges. Here was the outline of a league of nations, an outline whose completion was prevented by the natural fluctuations of wealth and power among states, and the inherent rivalries of men and groups. Thessaly formed a block of vassal states and permanently dominated the league. Other Amphictyonies were established. Athens, for example, belonged to the Amphictyony of Caloria, and the rival leagues, while promoting peace within their membership, became against other groups vast instruments of intrigue and war. 7. Festivals If it could not end war, Greek religion succeeded in alleviating the routine of economic life with numerous festivals. How many victims offered to the gods, cried Aristophanes, how many temples, statues, sacred processions. At every moment of the year we see religious feasts and garlanded victims of sacrifice. The rich paid the cost, the state provided the theorica, or divine funds, to pay to the populace the price of admission to the games or plays that distinguished the holy day. The calendar at Athens was essentially a religious calendar, and many months were named from their religious festivals. In the first month, Hecatombion, July to August, came the Cronia, responding to the Roman Saturnalia, when masters and slaves sat down together to a joyful feast. In the same month, every fourth year, occurred the Panathenaea, when, after four days of varied contests and games, the entire citizenship formed a solemn and colorful procession to carry to the priestess of Athena the sacred Peplos, a gorgeously embroidered robe which was to be placed upon the image of the city's goddess. This, as all the world knows, was the theme that Phidias chose for the frieze of the Parthenon. In the second month, Metagitneon, came the Metagitnea, a minor festival in honor of Apollo. In the third month, Bedromion, Athens sallied forth to Eleusis for the greater mysteries. The fourth month, Pionepsion, celebrated the Pionepsia, the Oscophoria, and the Thesmophoria. In this, the women of Athens honored Demeter Thesmophorus, the lawgiver, with a strange Thonian ritual, parading phallic emblems, exchanging obscenities, and symbolically going down to Hades and returning, apparently as magical ceremonies to promote fertility in the soil and man. Only the month of Mymacterion had no festival. In the month of Poseidon, Athens held the Italoa, a feast of first fruits, in Gamelion, the Linnea, in honor of Dionysus. In Anthesterion came three important celebrations, the Lesser or Preparatory Mysteries, the Diasia, or Sacrifice to Zeus Milikios, and above all, the Anthesteria, or Feast of Flowers. In this three-day spring festival to Dionysus, wine flowed freely and everybody was more or less drunk. There was a competition in wine drinking and the streets were alive with revelry. The King Archon's wife rode on a car beside the image of Dionysus and was married to it in the temple as a symbol of the union of the god with Athens. Beneath this jolly ritual ran a somber undertone of fear and propitiation of the dead. The living ate a solemn meal in commemoration of their ancestors and left for them pots full of food and drink. At the end of the feast the people chased the spirits of the departed from the house with a formula of exorcism. Out of the door with you, souls! Anthesteria is over! words that became a proverbial phrase for dismissing importunate beggars. In many parts of Europe, the people still believe that the ghosts of the dead return to earth yearly and must be entertained in a feast of all souls. In the ninth month, Elephabolian, came the great Dionysia, established by Pisistratus in 534. In that year, Pespis inaugurated the drama at Athens as part of the festival. It was the end of March, Spring was in the air, the sea was navigable, merchants and visitors crowded the city and swelled the attendance at the ceremonies and the plays. All business was suspended, all courts were closed. Prisoners were released to let them share in the festivities. Athenians of every age and class, brilliantly attired, took part in the procession that brought the statue of Dionysus from Eleutheri and placed it in his theater. The rich drove chariots, the poor marched on foot. A long train of animals followed as destined gifts for the gods. Choruses from the towns of Attica joined or competed in song and dance. In the tenth month, Munichion, Athens celebrated the Munichia, 
and Attica every fifth year celebrated the Rauronia in honor of Artemis. In Thargelion occurred the Thargelia, or Feast of the Grain Harvest. In the twelfth month, Scyrophorion, came the festivals of Scyrophoria, Eretophoria, Dipholia, and Buphonia. Not all these feasts were annual, but even for a four-year period they represented a grateful relief from daily toil. Other states had similar holidays, and in the countryside every sowing and every harvest was greeted with festal conviviality. Greater than all these were the Panhellenic festivals, the Panigyris, or universal gatherings. There were the Panionia on Mycale, the Feast of Apollo at Delos, the Pythian Festival at Delphi, the Isthmian at Corinth, the Nemean near Argos, the Olympic in Elis. These were the occasions of interstate games, but basically they were holy days. It was the good fortune of Greece to have a religion human enough, in later days humane enough, to associate itself joyfully and creatively with art, poetry, music, and games, even, at last, with morality. 8. Religion and Morals At first sight, Greek religion does not seem to have been a major influence for morality. It was, in origin, a system of magic rather than of ethics, and remained so in large measure to the end. Correct ritual received more emphasis than good conduct, and the gods themselves, on Olympus or on earth, had not been exemplars of honesty, chastity, or gentleness. Even the Eleusinian mysteries, though they offered supernatural hopes, made salvation depend upon ritual purifications rather than upon nobility of life. Patikion the thief, said the sarcastic Diogenes, will have a better fate after his death than Agesilaus or Epaminondas, for Patikion has been initiated at Eleusis. Nevertheless, in the more vital moral relations, Greek religion came subtly to the aid of the race and the state. The purification ritual, however external in form, served as a stimulating symbol of moral hygiene. The gods gave a general, if vague and inconstant, support to virtue. They frowned upon wickedness, revenged themselves upon pride, protected the stranger and the suppliant, and lent their terror to the sanctity of oaths. D.K., we are told, punished every wrong, and the awful Eumenides pursued the murderer, like Orestes, to madness or death. The central acts and institutions of human life, birth, marriage, the family, the clan, the state, received a sacramental dignity from religion, and were rescued from the chaos of hasty desire. Through the worship or honoring of the dead, the generations were bound together in a stabilizing continuity of obligations so that the family was not merely a couple and their children, or even a patriarchal assemblage of parents, children, and grandchildren, but a holy union and sequence of blood and fire stretching far into the past and the future, and holding the dead, the living, and the unborn in a sacred unity stronger than any state. Religion not only made the procreation of children a solemn duty to the dead, but encouraged it through the fear of the childless man that no posterity would inter him or tend his grave. So long as this religion kept its influence, the Greek people reproduced themselves vigorously, and as plentifully among the best as among the worst. And in this way, with the help of a merciless natural selection, the strength and quality of the race were maintained. Religion and patriotism were bound together in a thousand impressive rites. The god or goddess most revered in public ceremony represented the apotheosis of the city. Every law, every meeting of the assembly or the courts, every major enterprise of the army or the government, every school and university— every economic or political association, was surrounded with religious ceremony and invocation. In all these ways, Greek religion was used as a defense by the community and the race against the natural egoism of the individual man. Art, literature, and philosophy first strengthened this influence, and then weakened it. Pindar, Aeschylus, and Sophocles poured their own ethical fervor or insight into the Olympian creed, and Phidias ennobled the gods with beauty and majesty. Pythagoras and Plato associated philosophy with religion and supported the doctrine of immortality as a stimulus to morals. But Protagoras doubted, Socrates ignored, Democritus denied, Euripides ridiculed the gods. And in the end, Greek philosophy, hardly willing it, destroyed the religion that had molded the moral life of Greece. Chapter 9 The Common Culture of Early Greece 1. The Individualism of the State The two rival zeniths of European culture, ancient Hellas and Renaissance Italy, rested upon no larger political organization than the city-state. Geographical conditions presumably contributed to this result in Greece. 
Everywhere mountains or water intervened. Bridges were rare and roads were poor. And though the sea was an open highway, it bound the city with its commercial associates rather than with its geographical neighbors. But geography does not altogether explain the city-state. There was as much separatism between Thebes and Plataea on the same Boeotian plain as between Thebes and Sparta, more between Sybaris and Crotona on the same Italian shore than between Sybaris and Syracuse. Diversity of economic and political interest kept the cities apart. They fought one another for distant markets or grain, or formed rival alliances for control of the sea. Distinctions of origin helped to divide them. The Greeks considered themselves to be all of one race, but their tribal divisions, Aeolian, Ionian, Achaean, Dorian, were keenly felt, and Athens and Sparta disliked each other with an ethnological virulence worthy of our own age. Differences of religion strengthened as they were strengthened by political divisions. Out of the unique cults of locality and clan came distinct festivals and calendars, distinct customs and laws, distinct tribunals, even distinct frontiers, for the boundary stones limited the realm of the god as well as of the community. Cuhus regio, ehus religio. These and many other factors united to produce the Greek city-state. It was not a new administrative form. We have seen that there were city-states in Sumeria, Babylonia, Phoenicia, and Crete, hundreds or thousands of years before Homer or Pericles. Historically, the city-state was the village community in a higher stage of fusion or development, a common market, meeting ground, and judgment seat for men tilling the same hinterland, belonging to the same stock, and worshipping the same god. Politically, it was to the Greek the best available compromise between those two hostile and fluctuating components of human society, order and liberty. A smaller community would have been insecure, a larger one tyrannical. Ideally, in the aspirations of philosophers, Greece was to consist of sovereign city-states cooperating in a Pythagorean harmony. Aristotle conceived the state as an association of freemen acknowledging one government and capable of meeting in one assembly. A state with more than 10,000 citizens, he thought, would be impracticable. In the Greek language, one word, polis, sufficed for both city and state. All the world knows that this political atomism brought to Hellas many a tragedy of fraternal strife. Because Ionia was unable to unite for defense, it fell subject to Persia. Because Greece, despite confederacies and leagues, was unable to stand together, the freedom which it idolized was in the end destroyed. And yet Greece would have been impossible without the city-state. Only through this sense of civic individuality, this exuberant assertion of independence, this diversity of institutions, customs, arts, and gods, was Greece stimulated by competition and emulation to live human life with a zest and fullness and creative originality that no other society had ever known. Even in our own times, with all our vitality and variety, our mechanisms and powers, is there any community of like population or extent that pours into the stream of civilization such a profusion of gifts as flowed from the chaotic liberty of the Greeks? 2. Letters Nevertheless, there were common factors in the life of these watchfully separatist states. As far back as the 13th century B.C., we find one language throughout the Greek peninsula. It belonged to the Indo-European group, like Persian and Sanskrit, Slavonic and Latin, German and English. Thousands of words denoting the primary relations or objects of life have common roots in these tongues and suggest not only the predispersion antiquity of the things denoted, but the kinship or association of the peoples who used them in the dawn of history. It is true that the Greek language was diversified into dialects, Aeolic, Doric, Ionic, Attic, but these were mutually intelligible and yielded in the 5th and 4th centuries to a koine dialectos, or common dialect, which emanated principally from Athens and was spoken by nearly all the educated classes of the Hellenic world. Attic Greek was a noble tongue, vigorous, supple, melodious, as irregular as any vital speech, but lending itself readily to expressive combinations, delicate gradations and distinctions of meaning, subtle philosophical conceptions, and every variety of literary excellence from the many-billowed surge of Homer's verse to the placid flow of Plato's prose. We do not know how ancient Greek was pronounced. The accents that trouble us so much were seldom used by the classical Greeks, but were inserted into ancient texts by Aristophanes of Byzantium in the 3rd century B.C., these accents should be ignored in reading Greek poetry. Greek tradition attributed the introduction of writing into Greece to Phoenicians in the 14th century B.C., 
and we know nothing to the contrary. The oldest Greek inscriptions, dating from the 8th and 7th centuries, show a close resemblance to the Semitic characters on the 9th century Moabite stone. These inscriptions were written in Semitic fashion from right to left. 6th century inscriptions, for example at Cortina, were made alternately from right to left and from left to right. Later inscriptions are from left to right throughout, and certain letters are turned around accordingly. The Semitic names for the letters were adopted with minor modifications, but the Greeks made several basic changes. Above all, they added vowels, which the Semites had omitted. Certain Semitic characters denoting consonants or breathings were used to represent A, E, I, O, and U. Later, the Ionians added the long vowels eta, or long E, and omega, long or double O. Ten different Greek alphabets struggled for ascendancy as part of the War of the City-States. In Greece, the Ionian form prevailed and was transmitted to Eastern Europe, where it survives today. In Rome, the Chalcidian form was adopted from Cumi to become the Latin alphabet and ours. The Chalcidic alphabet lacked the long E and O, but, unlike the Ionian, retained the Phoenician vowel as a consonant, a V with approximately the sound of W. Hence the Athenians called wine oinos, the Chalcidians called it voinos, the Romans called it vinum or winum, we call it wine. Chalcis kept the Semitic copa or q and passed it on to Rome and ourselves. Ionia abandoned it, content with k. Ionia represented l as a, Chalcis as l. Rome straightened up the latter form and gave it to Europe. The Ionians used P for R, but in Greek Italy the P sprouted a tail and became R. The earliest uses of writing in Greece were probably commercial or religious. Apparently priestly charms and chants are the mother of poetry, and bills of lading are the father of prose. Writing split into two varieties, the formal for literary or epigraphic purposes, the cursive for ordinary use. There were no accents, no spaces between words, no punctuation points but a change of topic was marked off by a horizontal dividing stroke called the paragraphos, that is, a sign written on the side. The materials used to receive writing were various, at first, if we may believe Pliny, leaves or the bark of trees. For inscriptions, stone, bronze, or lead. For ordinary writing, clay tablets, as in Mesopotamia. Then wooden tablets covered with wax, which were popular in retrospect with schoolboys. For more permanent purposes, papyrus, which the Phoenicians brought from Egypt, and, in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, parchment made from the skins or membranes of goats or sheep. A metal stylus was used on wax tablets, on papyrus or parchment, a reed dipped in ink. Wax writing was erased with the flat butt of the stylus, ink with a sponge. So the poet Marshall sent a sponge with his poems to his friend, so that they might be wiped out with a stroke. Many a critic will mourn the passing of this courtesy. In no field have the old words so regularly come down to us as in that of writing. Paper, of course, is papyrus, and once again in the cycle of fashion, the substance is a compressed plant. A line of writing was a stikos, or row. The Latins called it a versus, or verse, that is, a turning back. The text was written in columns upon a strip of papyrus or parchment from twenty to thirty feet long, wound about a stick. Such a roll was called a biblos, from the Phoenician city, so named whence papyrus came to Greece. A smaller roll was called biblion. Our Bible was originally ta biblia, the rolls. When a roll formed part of a larger work, it was called a tomos, or cutting. The first sheet of a roll was called the protocolon, that is, the first sheet glued to the stick. The edges of the roll were smoothed with pumice and sometimes colored. If the author could afford the expense, or the roll contained important matter, it might be wrapped in a diphthera, or membrane, or as the Latins called it, a vellum. Since a large roll would be inconvenient for handling or reference, literary works were usually divided into several rolls, and the word biblos, or book, was applied not to each work as a whole, but to each roll or part. This book is continued on cassette 7, side 1.